Hello everyone and welcome back to episode 10 of our series on painting a Song of Ice and Fire tabletop game miniatures. This is finally it, the episode where we finish everything off and round up this series. First things first, we're going to be varnishing the miniatures with a bit of matte varnish, and then we're going to be moving on to just some detail work, finishing off the bases and the metal areas of the miniatures themselves. If you've been following along from home, you're going to be at the point where you now have a bunch of finished miniatures ready for the tabletop, and that is super exciting. If you've just been popping in here and there to get some tips on particular parts of the process, hopefully you can find some tips on how I finish off my miniatures here. I'm going to be doing all my varnishing by airbrush, for the same reasons that I explained I did my priming by airbrush in episode 1. This allows me to get a much more controlled, thin coat of varnish over the entire miniature, and therefore basically avoids some issues with pooling and with liquidity that I've gotten in the past when I was varnishing with a paintbrush. That being said, it's entirely possible to varnish with a paintbrush, even with this Liquitex matte varnish that I'm using here. Once again, my choice of material was informed by the fact that this matte varnish was on sale at Michael's, so I'm not talking about some sort of high-end stuff here necessarily. I mean, it might be great, I don't know, but uh, it is what I have and that's what I use, so hopefully you can find the same thing if you live in Canada or the United States where Michael's is located. If not, I'm sure any similar matte painter's varnish will be up to the job. The reason we're using matte varnish here is to finally cut that glossy texture that we've been getting over the course of painting these miniatures, because we've been using inks. If you use some acrylic paints, you might not get quite as glossy a surface, but uh, these inks really lay on, they get shiny, they get smooth, and that doesn't necessarily give us the finish we want for miniatures that are supposed to look like flesh and metal and skin. The metal should be glossy, but we'll get to that later. By applying a matte varnish to the whole thing, we're just going to sort of pull all that down and we're going to give it a rougher surface. If you don't really know what matte versus gloss means, and you might have seen it on paints or varnishes before, uh, finishes for wood, furniture, that kind of stuff. Basically a gloss has a really shiny surface, sort of like um, porcelain or metal. Um, not quite a mirrored surface, but it'll shine, it'll have some little spots of light, whereas a, a matte finish is going to be something a little more diffuse, it's going to spread the light a little more. The difference is stark. When you put uh, this matte varnish over top of an inked miniature, it really stands out immediately. I strongly recommend you look into getting a matte varnish, if you can, for your miniatures. I've also got gloss varnish, same brand, same location, same size of model and everything that I use for miniatures that need a little more gloss, for example, Stormtroopers. I've actually got a Star Wars Legion box in the closet, I'll probably be working on that at some point, and hopefully I can show some Stormtroopers being done. I'd love to get a really glossy finish on them, just like in the sort of original trilogy, beautiful, clean Stormtroopers. I know a lot of people are going for the sort of Rogue One dirty look, and I did love Rogue One, but uh, I'm going to be aiming more for the gloss, just for kicks. That is neither here nor there though. Right now we're working on a Song of Ice and Fire miniatures. So if we look at uh, what's going on right now, I am just dusting these miniatures from a long distance, just like I did with the primer. I want to make sure that I'm getting the thinnest possible layer of uh, varnish on them at all times. If you're doing this by paintbrush, really make sure that you've got a large, bristly, dry brush nearby that you're going to be able to use to wick away the varnish, just like we've been doing when we were wicking away our inks that float into areas we didn't want them. You can wick away the varnish when it starts pooling, and in fact it's going to start pooling. The varnish is going to flow over the whole miniature, at least if you're using the same stuff as I am, or any other varnish that I've really used in the past, and you'll probably get little puddles around the feet and in the elbows and stuff. With our inks so far, that's actually been the goal. We wanted it to get darker and deeper in all of those cracks, but with the varnish where it pools and gets thick, it's going to get sort of cloudy and white, and that really doesn't look good at all. So we're going to be trying to avoid that as best we can with uh, an extra brush wherever we can. Where we're applying it with an airbrush, we're probably not going to have any real issues with it pooling because we have such control over the layer that we're putting on. The one thing we might have though is, if you'll recall when we were priming, we kind of had the opportunity to turn the miniatures around and keep adding some more primer on whenever we saw an area that was missed. With the varnish, I really don't want to take that risk because I don't want that cloudy texture. The more varnish you put on, the more it's going to be affected by stuff like your environment and stuff. When I uh, lived out in Halifax, uh, that's in Nova Scotia, Canada, it's out on the east coast, right on the ocean, the temperature variations and the sort of weather we had there meant that every once in a while the varnish would actually get too moist and get really, really, really cloudy if it was even just a little bit of extra varnish in a location, it looked awful. So uh, just keep it really, really thin. What that means though is in this case, if you miss spots, you're probably not going to want to go back and re 
airbrush them like we were doing the primer. Fortunately for you, if you did miss a spot, I miss a spot as well in this episode, so we're going to be going back to touch it up later and I'll show you what I do to do that. Right now I've just finished up with my varnishing and I'm taking my airbrush away to clean it. With the varnish, just like with the primer, you're really going to want to make sure you clean it very well. Both products are products that are meant to help things adhere to a surface and make sure they stick around basically forever. So, you know, do the math. If uh, you are priming and or varnishing your airbrush, that could have some pretty significant impact on its uh, operation later. In this case, all I'm doing is I'm running some soapy water through it a few times and some normal water all fired at my freshly varnished cardboard screen there. But you certainly wouldn't be wrong to go ahead and soak your airbrush for a little while. I use a combination of Simple Green, which is a sort of biodegradable soap that I can find here in Canada that uh, I also use for stripping my miniatures, and a little bit of hot water. And I just set my airbrush in that for a little while after I've done a lot of priming or a lot of varnishing. If you take a look at the miniatures actually on screen right now, something really exciting is happening. You might see the matte effect having taken over on their surfaces. Uh, it's kind of subtle, but it's actually visible on the screen, and that's really exciting for me. It is so visible in real life. The matte varnish and taking away the gloss on top really reveals the texture of the ink underneath, and it does wonders for these miniatures looking a little more alive. What we're going to be doing now is we're going ahead to move to the metal finishing. For this, I'm going to be grabbing my Vallejo Model Colors Silver. Any silver metallic paint should work for this. Uh, in fact, in the past, I used a cheap silver acrylic that I had, but because I bought that Vallejo Medieval Colors set that I discussed in episode 8 or 9 when I was using the torque brown for my bases, I just use that silver now, and I'll keep using it until it's out. I haven't noticed a distinct difference, but you will find that some silver paints are more pale and more cool than others, some are a little warmer, so experiment a little bit if you do have the option of having several acrylic paints to get the metal look that you like best if you're into that. Otherwise, use whatever's on hand or whatever's cheapest. You know, it's your hobby. We're going to be applying this using a bit of a dry brushing technique again that keeps coming up. We're going to be dry brushing it over those areas that we previously set up with that sort of mix of black ink, uh, flow improver, and silver paint. To get a bit of a beaten steel or like hammered metal look. I'm not going for a perfect pristine silver finish on any of these guys because A, I don't think it looks that good at miniature scale, you don't get the reflections in it and so on, and B, none of these miniatures really, or these characters I guess that we're painting right now, I think would have the perfectly polished, you know, mirror sheen kind of armor that that would imply. You can do that, in that case I would recommend that you put on your thick layer of silver, you'd not even bother with the black earlier when we're base coating it, and you wash it with black afterwards. Of course in that case, you're still going to want to wait until after your matte varnish to put on your silver, because the matte varnish will pull away all of the gloss from the silver and leave it just pale grey, which is not very nice looking at all. I'm using a wide kind of old brush for this dry brushing, uh, mostly just to kind of get more area all at once. Uh, you could use a slightly larger brush, and I think you can probably be safe, especially with these miniatures that have large areas, except for the little areas like those rivets along the saddle. With this sort of middle ground wide but not huge brush, I'm able to just sort of drag it across the tops of the rivets without touching anything underneath, and for the most part that works very well. I do sort of miss my mark here and there, but silver is kind of nice in that it being just a pale grayish color with a little bit of shine in it. I'm not too worried about getting it where it shouldn't be because it's not that noticeable to be honest. Uh, that's why we put black down beforehand actually, is it, it really pops best on a dark color. And if there's no dark color underneath, like if we're getting it on a red for example, you're not going to see it that well. I do want to be careful around the horse's head here though because while doing the bridle I'm very very close to another black surface. And on that black surface it, it will show up and it'll be very noticeable that all of a sudden the horse is shiny. I follow the same dark base color than metal over top after the matte varnish uh, sort of process with pretty much any metal area I do in miniatures at this point. Later on, uh, if you check my Instagram, you'll see, I actually did uh, Jamie Lannister and Dragon Slayer Ornstein from the Dark Souls board game set, both of which are miniatures that very heavily used gold. In both cases, that gold is pretty pristine as well, so I wanted to make sure that it had some pretty good luster to it. What I ended up doing is a base color that was a mixture of black and bronze, which is 
sort of like gold, but a little browner, I guess. Uh, at least the Vallejo bronze color paint. I'm not going to talk about metallurgy here. Uh, that bronze and black underneath with a dry brush of gold meant that even though the matte varnish steals the shine out of the bronze in the paint, it still had a sort of brown in the shadows look that then made the gold pop really well, but also kept it warm. You know, the way the gold should be kind of warm. The, the flat gold paint is just yellow and on its own doesn't have much definition. But with that extra step of using a base color that was going to accentuate the dry brush of metal, I think both look really good. And, uh, if you follow me on Instagram or on Facebook, you can actually take a look at those pictures and let me know what you think. I'm going to go ahead now and just silver up all these miniatures, and I'll get back with any other comments as we go along.
Miniatures with a lot of plate armor, like Brienne here, or you'll see later Gregor Clegane, are the ones that'll benefit the most from doing the metals the way we just did them here. If you just laid on gray or silver flat, flat out, these wide areas of adjacent steel would have no definition whatsoever. Like I mentioned in uh, the previous comment there, you can put uh, black wash over top of steel and that'll do a little bit for it. I think Games Workshop, that's sort of how they normally do it. They use the um, um, the Nuln oil. Uh, they put it over silver and it uh, pulls out the sort of shadow of the silvered areas. It looks pretty good. And it will look a little more neat than this dry brushing on. Real, really well, realistically. Uh, it'll just look neater and it'll look more like shined actual plates of just straight up steel. That being said, I find by dry brushing it on over top of a dark color, while it doesn't look as even, especially up close, it does look like beaten hammered metal. It looks like a more sort of rustic armor look that implies these characters have actually been fighting in this metal. It was not just, you know, pressed out of aluminum like a movie prop. It is a uh, hammered worked piece of metal that's had oil put on it it's got some sweat in it it's got some dirt in it you know i, f I find it's character obviously give it a shot both ways see what you prefer i might even be going over to the null oil method eventually who knows but for now this is how i do it and, and you can really see on the plates on Brienne here the shading and the sort of dynamic nature of having dry brushed it on and keeping the dark areas uh, it, it really there's no contest for me as far as this versus a flat coat with just a wash on top.
Now that we've knocked out all of the silver areas on our miniatures, it's time to get to this area around the bridle where some red leaked and once we applied the matte on without the sort of gloss finish of the black ink, it was very obvious that some red had leaked onto the uh, pelt of the horse. <laughs> it looked like it had been stabbed or hit with an arrow or something. That wasn't really what I was going for. So I'm going to be using my Mod Podge matte blue, which uh, you just saw there. The same stuff we used for affixing the static grass in episode 9. I'm going to be using a little bit of that with some black ink. Now the Mod Podge has a matte finish, so it's actually going to serve sort of like Sort of like our varnish. Actually, Mod Podge on the can says that it acts as a sealant and stuff. You can use it as a varnish as well. I, I've never tried that, so, you know, I don't know, use it at your own risk. But for little patchwork repairs like this, um, it's actually great. It's going to add a matte component to whatever you're putting on. So with our black ink mixed with some Mod Podge matte, we're actually going to get a matte finish on the little patch, or close enough for army work, as it were. It's going to sink into the crack there and take away the shine. So I'm adding a little more Mod Podge. I'm just trying to get it sort of a light gray instead of being the glossy black that the ink on its own is. And then I'm going to grab it on a brush. I'm going to twist my brush as per usual to keep that point on. And I'm just going to slide it into the little gap there. Of course, while I'm doing this, I'm being very, very careful not to go over the edges and ruin my red because then going red over this new black, uh, anyway, you don't want to be going back and forth in those kind of directions, so I'm just going to try and keep it right in the area and move on from there. Right here, I did actually go a little bit over the lines and onto the bridle, so I get my flow improver, because I'm going to use it, uh, it, it's not a thinner per se, but it has some thinner-esque properties, I'm going to be using those thinner-esque properties to dab away that black, or at least I would be. By the time I get around to it and I take a look, uh, the black's actually sort of flowed back into place. And I just look at it under multiple angles and I decide, you know what, it's not that big a deal and I don't want to take the risk of the flow improver sort of smudging or interfering with the varnish or something like that. So I'm just going to, you know, turn it around, make sure I'm happy with the finish. The, the black area that leaked over, if you take a look, it's kind of under the chin, so it kind of looks shaded. I'm not going to mess with it too much. But that is an option you would have. If you find somewhere you've gone over when you're patching something up in such a way that you don't like, just use your thinner or a dry brush to wick it away, dab it away very, very slowly and not damage the uh, miniature's finish too much. What I'm doing now is I'm grabbing a little more of that Mod Podge and I'm just going to be using it straight without any color in it because I'm not trying to patch anything up to just uh, touch up another couple places where the varnish didn't cover properly. Um, on the top edge of the bridles on his uh, left side, there's actually some areas that are still shiny and so don't really look like cloth, they look shiny. So I'm grabbing a little bit of the Mod Podge and I'm just going to apply it really, really thinly and really, really lightly with the point of a precise brush across the area that I want to seal up. Again, the finish on the Mod Podge isn't going to be exactly the same as your matte varnish, but it's going to be really, really close. It's, it's still going to matte up the areas that you need matte. When you first apply it, it'll look kind of glossy because it's sort of like a white blue, really, uh, in consistency and uh, look. But uh, carry on from there, uh, let it sit, and once it's dried up, you're actually going to get a really nice matte finish out of it. The next thing we're going to be doing is I'm wiping off my palette as best I can. Obviously the palette's sort of starting to show the uh, signs of wear from having been used this whole time. Um, as time goes on, I actually start cleaning my palette more and more rigorously between painting sessions whenever I have the time. Of course, I'm painting around work, like uh, many of you probably are, so uh, it feels like I have time pressures, but uh, honestly, the cleanup is worth it. There are some occasions in sort of recordings I've done for future episodes where you have a really good example of how my flow improver actually pulls up color from the palette and uh, goes on to corrupt the paint, that, or the finish I was trying to get, you know, like pulling up a little bit of the red that's already dried on there, and therefore my dark wash ends up pink, that kind of thing. So cleaning your palette is actually helping yourself in the future as well. I do recommend it whenever you can. Just in this case, uh, I let it get away from me. So nobody's perfect, right? Uh, what I'm using right now is I'm using a, uh, it's, it's called a Flow Acrylic from Michaels. It's basically just a black acrylic paint, but it's got uh, lower viscosity than their normal acrylic paint, I guess. Uh, it's also sold in <laughs> massive buckets, so it's way cheaper than acrylic paints, uh, even with coupons or whatever. So I use that as my glossy black acrylic whenever I need it. In this case, I'm going to be applying that glossy black acrylic to the eyes of the 
horse to give them a sort of glossy horse look and uh, sort of differentiate them from the rest of the body because right now the whole horse being black much as that is sort of you know, blackfish's motif um, doesn't look that interesting <laughs> so I tried doing the horseshoes earlier, and now I'm doing the eyes uh, just to pull out some details and change the texture across those areas. By putting this glossy black acrylic on the top, I'm going to get a slightly glossier finish on the eyes, and the texture difference hopefully will be nice, and, and I think it did. The next thing I'm going to be doing with that glossy black acrylic is the rim of the bases. And like an absolute madman, for some reason, I started up with this um, pointed brush. <laughs> I realize it right now, and, and I'm going to switch over to a wider brush. That's that's foolish. But painting the edges of the bases, another thing that I kind of didn't bother doing, uh, entirely out of laziness, because the effect is immediate, and the work that you need to put in is almost nothing. I do it after varnishing so that the edge of the base stays a little glossy, it looks a little artificial, I really like it, it makes everything pop out from the scenery. And I get a really nice clean finish with this Flow Acrylic because it has, because of that lo slightly lower viscosity than your usual acrylic paints, it actually seems to settle down and uh, dry as a really smooth coat, which I love. Um, I'm sure you could get the same thing by just thinning out a black paint, but I've got these big cheap bottles of quote unquote Flow Acrylic. Um, and they do it for me, so too easy. Take a look for that if you do have access to a Michaels. If you're in one of the vast majority of countries that don't have access to a Michaels, um, but you do know a chain that's really good that people from your country or your area might be able to use to get some cheap but effective art supplies, throw it down in the comment section because obviously that's helpful for everyone. Um, knowing where to look is great. And, and I'm gonna be real with my American and Canadian counterparts. Michaels is not the best place for value in general. Um, but it does have a pretty good selection and the coupons are kind of nice. Uh, so if you're using their like actual value products, you're going to get an okay price if you're using the coupon as well. But obviously, those who go to Michaels will know that for some things it's also gratuitously overpriced. So, you know, use your better judgment. Back to the bases though, using this black acrylic flow paint, I'm just trying to make a really neat edge around the edges of the miniatures base. Using the lines of the miniatures base as a bit of a guide and the lines on the edge of where I've textured. Uh, I'm going to try and get it to be as close to a real circle as I can, but obviously I don't have the steadiest hands and I'm just going to go with whatever looks good. Once that's done, immediately, uh, whether you put them on terrain or put them on anything else, those miniatures are going to be popping out of the ground. They're going to be looking like, you know, these standalone figures. Maybe that's not what you want. Um, for me, I love the sort of statuette effect and it. Um, the black contrasts so well with the base, which contrasts so well with the miniature, that I find it makes everything sort of stand out and draws the eye better. But if that's not your thing, you might want to go ahead and do the base edges in a dark brown. Um, you could probably do it with the same kind of ink wash that we used earlier. Uh, or you could do them in a green, or even color them based on their faction in the game, so it's easier to differentiate. With characters like... Um, Brienne here, who's a quote-unquote mercenary in the Song of Ice and Fire tabletop game, that might be a little harder, she's brown anyway, according to the plastic colors, but obviously you can make it up as you go. I know a lot of guys who do military games will paint the bases of their uh, miniatures, especially Crossfire, because that demands an actual chain of command as far as I know. You might paint them in different colors depending on what platoon or company they're in, or you might paint them in different colors. Um, relevant to something that's useful in your particular rules that you're playing with. With the black bases, what I have is I bought a big bag of like a thousand cheap elastic bands on Amazon, and I can just wrap those around a uh, black base. These ones are a little hard to do because they got a rounded edge, but if you just get like your sort of generic X Games Workshop circular miniature bases, you could wrap an elastic band around there of a certain color and that can help denote faction affiliation or any other information that you're trying to note with the character. And then the bases can stay black and standard between everyone.
with the last of our bases done, that actually wraps up our series on uh, these four miniatures that we've been working with for so long. In this episode, we varnished them with a matte varnish, painted their bases, and finished up the metal areas. I hope you've learned something and enjoyed yourselves for the duration of this entire series, actually. Um, I've loved making it. This is really a really cool project for me to have picked up, and I'm enjoying it. I hope I'm getting better, and if you have any feedback, feel free to leave it in the comments. I'll read them all, because there aren't that many right now. Um, Future of the channel-wise, uh, next episode, if you're interested in that kind of thing, is going to be a more traditional YouTube-style painting tutorial where we're going to mash all of these episodes together into one episode that sort of sums it up, although it cuts out all the work sections. Um, and then after that, we're going to be doing uh, an episode, a special episode on stripping, which I sort of promised back in episode one, because I think stripping is a really important thing to understand and to see how easy it is. Um, and after that, we're going to be going forward with... Uh, another series of painting some more miniatures from the Song of Ice and Fire tabletop game. If you want some previews of what kind of stuff is coming up in the future of the channel, uh, my Instagram, which is linked on the YouTube channel here, and my Facebook um, sort of group page, which is Jacques of All Games, obviously, are both great places to look because I try to post sort of in-progress pictures as I go along of everything I'm working on, and the episodes are backlogged for a little while because I'm trying to pace myself. Um, work takes me away from home quite often, and I want to be able to make a backlog of episodes that can sort of play when I'm not there. So uh, yeah, you can get some previews up to months in advance before the episodes come out at this rate. Um, and if you have any feedback about stuff you'd like to see, that would be a great place to catch me so I can start working on it ASAP and start working on those episodes, because like I said, uh, I've got a job and I've got sort of other obligations that might pull me away for time uh, here and there. So I got to be working on this stuff ahead of time and planning ahead a little bit. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching this series so far, and I hope you'll stick around for the future episodes. Um, and yeah, definitely throw some stuff down in the comments. I I'd love to hear it. Anyway, until next time, go play some games.